Okay. Three o'clock. We can get ourselves started. This first, uh, it only goes through uh, the really kind of the overview of how these slides will work. Uh, all these slides are available on uh, on Canvas. So this week, I'm going to go through chapters one and two, but feel free to go as far down as you as you want as you can. Um, I kind of made myself a little schedule uh, here where uh, this week I'll do chapters one and two. Next week I'll do three and four, then five and six, then seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And that'll give us a week, uh, basically a week off where we can, uh, anybody can catch up on any assignments missed or any uh, questions that they may have. That's kind of what, what we're looking at for the next, um, the next eight or seven weeks is I'm going to do two chapters a week. And then that gives us a week uh, break. So uh, VMware is basically what's running behind the scenes when we talk about virtualization in the cloud. Uh, it, it is not the only infrastructure that is used for virtualization at large scale, but it is definitely the top one. Only uh, its second would be like uh, Hyper-V for any local virtualization. Um, outside of that, you have um, Zen as, as another possibility, but it's the, really the two mm -hmm. top uh, are VMware and Hyper-V. Uh, VMware really does the job well in handling multi operating systems in one and fault tolerances and all kinds of crazy configurations that you'll see in this course. Uh, like I said, this first this first little uh, chapter is very very short and kind of introduces things that uh, you'll you'll recognize as we go. For example, uh, when it's using different kinds of of uh, fonts uh, from a folder versus a command versus something configuration, you'll you'll see these throughout the throughout these chapters. There are a number of reference guides that uh, these slides will make, will point to. I would make a note of them uh, because they will be referenced often. And it's good to have uh, bookmarks when you're referencing information because nobody, nobody is asking you to memorize everything off the top of your head. Uh, but being able to look up things quickly and, and find resolutions is definitely something that you should be able to do. Uh, there's also a number of sites like blogs and support that you can use uh, as you study, as you practice, that are available to you, that are freely available to you. Uh, like I said, this course does uh, satisfy the training requirement for the VCP certification. It does not get you a voucher, but it does take care of the training portion. So don't just use this as your only resource for preparing uh, for the CERT test if you are looking to get VCP Foundation certified. Uh, they do have further education that you can do on demand or um, uh, on your own kind of stuff. You know, if your goal is to get certified, to get this VMware Certified Professional uh, Cert, you are definitely on the right track. Like I said, it's a nice short little, uh, little module. Chapter two, though, is where we'll spend our time today. Kind of introducing some of the stuff. Uh, some of these things you will have seen in your micro courses. So this should be a lot of review. Uh, as, as I said, all of this relies on virtualization technology, something that 
nobody thought of in the early 2000s came about in the later uh, 2000s really took off and now we we use containers on top of virtualization in the cloud it's pretty crazy so down to the basics you have a physical system who is running a virtual instance of itself it's it is a virtual machine it is a, a complete computer running inside a computer kind of like the inception movie so you have an operating system running you have uh vmware tools which is basically the drivers required for this operating system to uh, to work with the with the quote unquote uh, virtual devices because the networking the network card is not a real network card. Uh, the video card is not a real video card. It, it's all software and it needs software in order to communicate and function uh, as though it's connected on a physical system. Now, one of the biggest advantages of virtualization is when you have, uh, when you buy a $10,000 server, you can use all the, the CPU, all the memory, all the hard drive space effectively, rather than installing the operating system on the bare metal and only using a portion of it. I mean, it, even in our own desktop systems, we don't tend to use 100% of the CPU and memory, nor do we really want to. We'll use it in, in our games. You know, we'll try to max it out as much as possible. But for everyday computing, we really don't use a lot of power. So can you imagine spending so much money on a piece of hardware and not using its full potential? That's horrible. Using virtual machines, though, we can segment and isolate and do all kinds of stuff to maximize our physical hardware and, and really use the the really use the, um, all of it. There are different kinds of virtualization. The one that we're more focused on is using uh, servers to virtualize. So we can create uh, virtual networks, we can create storage, uh, and we can even virtualize desktops within uh, these more powerful servers. This does mean everything is software defined. If you've ever seen the, uh, the acronym SDN, Software Defined Networks, well, this is software defined everything. Not only are we using software to do things like computing, storage, and network, we're also pooling our resources using software. We're also uh, cat, uh, using catalogs to quickly spin up and spin down stuff. Uh, we're using software for fault tolerance and disaster recovery and replication, along with security and management. We're heavily relying on software to maximize the use of our hardware. Uh, with vSphere, in the VMware world, there's even a cloud function where we can have different cloud infrastructure scattered even around the world and be able to move VMs throughout in order to keep systems on or, or do backups or a hot site to a cold site. Uh, we can do all those things in the VMware ecosystem. The basic parts of any virtual machine are things like the CPU, the memory, the disk, the network. These, these are your essential resources that are used by any and all systems. And again, a virtual machine is just an abstraction in software of these things. Now in a in a physical infrastructure, 
the operating system takes control of these hardware devices, these hardware components and utilizes them. In a virtual architecture, we use a hypervisor in our case vSphere to allocate the resources that we have like our CPU, our memory, our disks, our network in order to allow multiple operating systems to utilize 100% of what we have and also be able to manage it all without us uh, micromanaging every little thing. So the virtual machines can share the same CPU, they can share memory, they can share the network card and disk space and be able to work with each other and run, uh, run simultaneously. From the perspective of the physical device, virtual machines look like programs, like your browser, Discord, uh, Word. You know, the, the physical CPU is processing these things like it would any other program. The things that are happening within those programs, that's the virtual machine. Because we are working software, we can determine a lot of things that we can't easily do in the physical. For example, if we have a physical system that has four CPUs, four physical CPU chips in the virtual realm, we can define and say, uh, Virtual machine A, you will only have one CPU, whereas virtual machine B will have access to two. Virtual machine C can have up to four. You can't necessarily go, I mean, you can, it's just not feasible, it's not easy to get, uh, open up a, a server and take out CPUs and put them in. Uh, that's, you know, that's not as easy, but we can definitely virtually uh, give and take resources on the fly. Same with memory. The physical hardware knows how much we have to fully allocate and we can use our hypervisor, in our case vSphere, to divvy up the, the memory for various virtual machines and be able to do that in a very easy way uh, that doesn't slow us down, but more efficiently uses the resources we have. With networking, any virtual machine can communicate with another virtual machine and the, the operating systems within them will, will create their packets like they would always if it was physical and send it out the virtual uh, NIC card. Once that packet leaves the that operating system as it would in in real life, that packet essentially goes through the CPU of the physical host. It doesn't necessarily have to use the actual NIC in order to get out, unless it is getting out. But if virtual machine A is communicating with virtual machine C, you will never see any packets leave the network. They're talking within each other. So which means this communication is gonna happen way faster than it would uh, going from the virtual machine out to the world and back. Uh, virtual machines use threads. Yes, they, they use threads. Uh, in, in the world of VMware, we can share storage just like we can share the others. The virtual, the VM file system, NFS, vSAN, vSphere, you'll, we'll talk about these as we go along in the chapters. Uh, there's a number of ways that our, our OSs can share uh, resources. Because 
virtual machines are nothing more than files. It is very easy to encapsulate them. You know, they, they are nothing more than just a bunch of files. They just so happen to be able to be processed in a way that they create a, a virtual instance of a physical computer, which means they are easy to be moved around. That's why you can take a virtual machine from one physical computer and take it to another and it will still work because it's all software based. As you will see when you do some of the, the NetLab labs and as we talk through, uh, there are a number of ways to communicate with our, uh, with our clients. We can either use the web client uh, there is a, um, an add-on that you can add to a browser in order to see, or you can directly connect uh, to a host uh, through uh, vCenter, for example. Um, generally, you want to connect through the web client. The latest versions of vSphere do have HTML5 support, so you don't need Flash. It still will be the same site. So it'll be an HTTPS site. Uh, it'll, it'll be your uh, vCenter appliance. Uh, you know, it could be the IP address and then slash vSphere client, and you'll be directed to it. You can add. Windows authentication, so you can use Active Directory in order to uh, log in. Like I said, there is a uh, HTML5 base that doesn't depend on any Adobe, uh, but it does use Java. So it'll be that, HTTPS, uh, your IP address slash UI if you want to get to the hypervisor. ESXi is the hypervisor that sits below. Uh, vSphere client is what will allow you to manage the clients themselves. And again, we'll, we'll cover this as we uh, get into the, the chapters. This is important. What each file is. Because a, a virtual machine in itself is kind of the abstract, that's the whole you have all of that stored in a folder for easy convenience and, and having everything together. And then what each file is. This, is. this is important to know. So for example, the configuration file of the virtual machine, what has the name, which has the description, which has what network card it's using, um, how big the hard drive is and where it is, all that kind of stuff. That is the .vmx file. Uh, if there is a swap file, you will see it as a VSWP file. The BIOS is NVRAM. The disk is VMDK. There are a number of VMDK types, but they are all, anything that is a disk file will be VMDK. So for example, a flat file will have VM, the name of it, dash flat, and then dot VMDK. Any snapshots will have a different format. They'll be VMSDs or SNs or uh, the memory is a different, is uh, VMEM. If the VM gets suspended, it goes to a different file. Even though this is completely virtual, it does have its limitations. Some of the limitations are shown here. For example, you can have up to two IDE controllers. If we're talking about a older OS, we can have up to three parallel ports, 32 serial ports, we can have one USB controller with 20 devices attached to it. We can have a floppy with two devices. 
one floppy controller with two floppy drives. We can have up to four SCSI adapters with 64 adapt, uh, devices per, one mouse, one keyboard, up to 128 CPUs, six terabytes of RAM, 10 network cards, and one hardware 3D video card. Now, obviously, if your physical uh, hardware doesn't have six terabytes of RAM, you can't assign six terabytes of RAM. Uh, but these are the limits for a virtual machine. Hardware versions are a, a good thing to know. It is necessary to know uh, what hardware version ties with what. Uh, so for example, anything that you see that's hardware version 10 comes from ESXi 5.5. Anything 6.0 is 11, 6.5, 13, and so on. That comes into play when uh, you're, you're working with different virtual machines from different people and they were created on different systems or uh, you need to make a virtual machine and you have the latest version of ESXi. So you have 6.7, but the system that you're going to import this VM to is running 6.0. Well, you need to make sure that your hardware version matches the, the one that you're building for. You have a variety of choices when it comes to storage. You can go from bus all the way to a virtual NVMe. This is all in order for you to be able to simulate whatever physical uh, hardware you need for the OS. Whenever you see thick versus thin provision, thick provision means if we're making a drive of 20 gigabytes, we're going to, we're going to actually create a file and it's going to take 20 gigabytes. Rather than a thin provision disk that says, oh, we're 20 gigabytes big, but it's really only using two gigabytes because that's how much data it actually has. A thin provision disk will grow, uh, whereas a thick provision won't. There are two sub options between thick and thick provision. You have the eager zero and lazy zero. In eager zero, um, every block is pre-filled with a zero in lazy zero, every, uh, every block has a zero when data is written to that block. Here's thin provision, like I said, uh, just because you make a, for example, here you make a 40 gigabyte disk, but you're not using the, 40 giga, the full 40 gigabytes, it won't actually use uh, the full. It knows the maximum, but the, the file itself is only as big as the amount of data it stores. Here's a, a chart kind of showing you uh, all the options that you have and kind of side-by-side uh, -side comparison. Virtual networks the way that the virtual machines will be able to talk to one another. You can define the type of adapter that it will use, the port group that will be connected to, the state, whether on or off, and whether you want the network card to be turned on the moment the VM turns on. So basically think of the, the last option is, is the cable physically connected to the NIC card or is it disconnected? of the NIC card.
There are three main network adapter types. You got the flexible, the E1000, and the VMX Net3. VMX Net3 tends to be the, the uh, one that is always recommended because it works with VMware tools and is native to the VMware world. The E1000s work on some operating systems, not all. You do have a few more options like SRIOV pass-through, which again, it can only support a few OSs. Uh, the direct path uh, using physical PCI network functions and PVR DMA, which provides an RDMA-like interface for any vSphere guests. Now that we covered the main items that are needed to operate a virtual machine, we have a few miscellaneous items like CD DVD drive. Whenever you want to install an operating system, you need an ISO file in order to get the process started. Uh, USB 3.0 is supported in virtual machines. Floppy drives are still around just in case you need to run something that requires a floppy. You also have generic SCSI and you have virtual GPU cards. These are all available to your virtual machine. The console where you're gonna spend most of your time has a number of items, for example, where you see uh, what's happening with the client, where you can interact with it, where you can uh, reach the console in order to get a GUI of the VM, uh, along with resetting, uh, turning it off, snapshots, all that kind of stuff is all done through the web client. Any questions before I move on? to this next portion. Okay. So here we go. ESXi is the hypervisor. This is what you install into the physical system. It is freely available. So you can install it on any hardware that supports it. It is very small. It does not use a lot of CPU. It doesn't use a lot of memory or a hard drive space because it is a, a very shrunken down Linux OS that only does a few things because it's a, you're supposed to be able to manage it from things like vCenter or uh, through the web. So in order for all these, uh, for all this to function, you need to have that hypervisor installed, which is the VM kernel. That is what pr will provide you the availability to do everything from running vCenter to controlling uh, what's happening to managing the resources. That is the, the fundamental base that you need. It is what stands between the physical hardware and everything else that we'll talk about. Installing it is pretty straightforward, especially because it doesn't have a lot of options to maneuver. If you are ever looking at ESXi from a console, uh, like you attach a keyboard mouse to monitor to, you're not gonna get much. For example, you'll be greeted with this, where you would hit F2 to log in, and then you have a very few, few items here to change, like the password, uh, the management network that controls the system, uh, the keyboard and the system logs. 
all the more complex stuff is done through vCenter, not, uh, not in this console. For example, here you can enable or disable SSH, and then you would have to use a, another system to SSH into the box. It comes with a firewall that automatically blocks any incoming and outgoing traffic, except for whatever is approved. That of course you can adjust when you log in to the web client. Uh, things like NTP and DCUI can be turned on and off as needed. Um, if there are any local users created, they'll be managed through through the uh, the command ESX CLI. But usually, uh, you have you have your root account that you should uh, install a, a secure password to, and then manage it through vCenter. Um, you should have your hypervisors connected to an NTP server in order to have an accurate time uh, so that your graphs are accurate, so that everything is synchronized, so your logs are all matched. Um, it is very important to have uh, your, your hosts with the proper time. You can uh, something in 6.7, do a quick boot where we don't really restart the entire system. Because if you've ever worked with a server, you know it, it takes quite a number of minutes for the physical box to start up again. Uh, there is an option in 6.7 where the system will reboot, but it will really reinitialize uh, the operating system and not so much the physical hardware. Uh, the demo you'll see as you work in the labs. Any questions? That is actually all of uh, module two. Like I said, these chapters aren't, aren't huge. Um, they're, not, they're not too crazy but I did split them up so that uh, we can cover a little, little bit by bit as we go. But again, feel free, if you feel like you can, you have the time to go further ahead, you are more than welcome to go ahead. And I will be recording two chapters uh, every week until uh, week seven. And then week eight, there won't be a live stream uh, in order to allow everybody to catch up. And then we'll pick up again week nine with two chapters all the way to the end. I'll start making this video. Um, are there any questions? Awesome. If you do come up with any, feel free to ask away in Discord. <laughs> 